I spent the last year remastering classic games into new 3D styles, and next on the list was the original Pokemon games. And while Nintendo did just release their Diamond and Pearl remakes with 3D graphics, it was more like a 2.5D game. I wanted to be able to explore the world of Pokemon in full 3D, so I did exactly that. And these projects keep getting bigger and bigger, so uh, subscribe for that, I guess. We won't be able to hit a million by the end of the year, but we can definitely try for 500k. This time around, I tried out something new and tried streaming the process of me creating the game. During that stream, I managed to create a model for Red, attach it to a moving player component in Unity, as well as create small props like flowers and signs, and make the starting area of the game Pallet Town. Along the way, I also managed to confuse a lot of people with the way I modeled certain things, since I changed the black color to white so I could see what I was working with. And people had no idea what this was supposed to be until I started placing it on the map. Suffice to say, the stream went well. At this point, I decided to pause and think about how I wanted the game to look. I originally modeled red in color, but the references I used for Pallet Town were all in black and white, so I ended up making a black and white color for red as well. From there, I had the option of either trying to make up colors for the monochrome world, or I could continue with making everything black and white. I ended up doing everything with grayscale, and after finishing everything, I'm actually happy that I did, because I think it has a really cool stylized look to it that many games don't have, and it also gave me the option of doing something really cool with post-processing effects. Since everything is monochrome, you can basically dye it any color that you want, so instead of it being all black and white, you can dye it a shade of green, and make it look like a game straight off of a Game Boy, or you can dye it red or blue to match the names of the original games, and I made it so that you can switch between these color modes at any time, but let's not get ahead of ourselves yet. By the end of the stream, all I had finished was one town, and there was still all of this area of the map left to do. So what I did next was go all around the map placing random props I had already made, like the trees and the fence posts. And there were actually two different types of trees on the overworld map, one of which I had already created during the stream, and the other one was a slightly fatter version of the first one. Also, you might notice that these trees all just look like stumps of a cutdown tree, but in later games like Heart Gold and Soul Silver, you can see that these are fully grown trees, so that's why I made them trees instead of stumps. After hours and hours of slowly duplicating trees and placing them around the map, I was finally finished with an outline of what the level would look like. The next thing I wanted to do was change the skybox, because I don't think that the default Unity skybox is a good fit for a stylized black and white game. I didn't feel like making a new skybox, so I looked to see if there's anything that I already had that would work instead. And for some reason this material for water reflection works perfectly. Unity also gives me a warning that it's not supposed to be used as a skybox, but I'm just gonna ignore that. And now the most tiring part of the level building process was next, which was creating the actual level. The floor for the character to stand on. It wouldn't be so bad if it was just one giant plane, but the problem comes from these little bumps. In the game, Red can jump off of these while traveling south, but can't travel back up them north. To me, this indicated an obvious elevation change, kind of like the problem I faced in the Zelda remake. One solution that I could have done was just make everything flat, and then make these parts into ramps. But I also decided that that would be boring, so instead I opted to take that entire section and raise it up a bit. I had to find the perfect height for the elevation change that would be tall enough so that Red could step up onto it, but also short enough so that it wouldn't turn into Mount Everest after going up a few times. Pokemon was originally a tile-based game, and I ended up using a similar workflow a tile would be represented in Unity using a scale of 1.075. That means that each tile on the map is 1.705 units wide. It basically just took a lot of trial and error to find a number that would match up with the map image that I found. But using that tile scale, I found that dividing it by 3 gave me the perfect height for these elevation increases. And after finishing Route 1, I think that the height was perfect for it. However, there was one other part of the level building process that was really difficult, and that was the fact that there were so many different types of textures that I would need. This area is all grass, while this area is all little patches of grass and this area is mostly white, with some patches of grass scattered here and there, and I couldn't really find a good way to try and replicate this. With my limited knowledge of Pro Builder, I had to build the level a few tiles at a time. Then I would figure out which faces on the object would need to be which materials, and apply them this way. If anyone knows an easier or faster method, please let me know because this is honestly where I spend most of the time making these games. It would help me with getting more videos out faster if I can speed up the level building process. But anyways, after I finished Route 1, I realized that all the props were still on the same level as the map, so I had to adjust them to fit with these new elevation changes, and instead of continuing on with Viridian City next, I decided that I wanted to go the opposite direction and continue with Route 21, south of Pallet Town. This route is almost entirely covered with water, so I had to create a new material using the water shader that I always use. And like always, I can't just make a few large faces like this and then apply the water shader, because then it doesn't work properly. It works best when there are many smaller faces, to make it look like there are waves in the water. So I had to make one row of faces at a time, and do this across the entire route. But after applying the water shader, the results were very worth the effort. And I just continued on making the water all the way up to Fusha City. Then I modeled the areas for Cinnabar Island into the Seafoam Island. I made the edges of the island slanted so that the character could walk up the side after coming off of the water. I decided to hold off on the buildings until the end, so for now I just made a simple model for the grass and replaced it around the islands. Then I made some new materials for the rocks, and made some objects 
of the rock structures on Seafoam Island. For the entrances to these caves, I just reused the door that I had made for the castle in the Mario remake, and I think it actually works pretty well here too. And the last thing I did here before moving on was making these little wooden docks. I made little rectangle shapes with some cylinders attached to the bottom, and put them in a few places in the water, and I made sure to place it at a height where Red is easily able to step up onto them when he's surfing on the water. Then everything else was pretty much the same for the rest of Kanto. One interesting thing to note was these maze created with these fence posts. I actually had to place more fences to block off the player because in a 3D space, he could have easily just cheated and walked through some of these spots. And I also had to fix up some other spots with fences like this too. The right side of the map was pretty cool because it was almost entirely made up of wooden docks on the waterfront, which ended up looking really good. And then the northern half of the map is mostly made up of mountains. So I reused the rock structures from before and created the mountains near Lavender City, Cerulean City, and the power plant. And the last interesting thing before moving on to the buildings are these little rods and the balls attached to them. Route 11 makes a maze out of these, and the surrounding area is made up of tall grass where wild Pokemon can attack you. And now at this point with the layout of the map finished, it was time to add the finishing touches with the buildings. During the live stream I mentioned at the beginning, I managed to finish the building that Red lives in and use this as a base. All the houses use the same door and the same windows. The only thing that changes is the shape of the building or the design on the walls. Some buildings are taller, some buildings are wider, and some are shaped completely like cubes. And for the Pokemart and the Poke Center, those also used the same building as a base, but just threw on a sign on the front that said Poke or marked on it. The really interesting areas are Saffron City and Celadon City because of the giant buildings that they have. Saffron City is home to the Silphco office building, which towers over everything in the game, and it looks really cool from far away. Celadon City also has a very tall building with the giant Pokemart that it had. Moving over one more city, you can also see Lavender Tower sitting on top of a hill in Lavender City. The last thing to do now is add all the wild tall grass and the cuttable trees that can be cut down with the cut HM. And with that, the entire overworld is complete. Or, well, mostly complete. I did all of the cities, all of the routes, placed every object and building and prop, and just in general tried to make this as accurate of a recreation as I could, and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. But for now, I'm going to be skipping out on some areas like Victory Road. By the time I got here, it was already getting close to the end of November, and I still had to do the entire battle system and create this video. So in order to finish this video by the end of the year, I had to move on and finish the rest if I had time. I created a new scene for the battles, but then I realized that I've never made a turn-based game like this before, and I didn't really know where to start. I ended up finding a really cheap asset on the Unity Asset Store that helped me get started. It came with a bunch of useful stuff, like frameworks to create different types of monsters, different Pokemon types like Grass and Fire, as well as types of moves. It also came with a short example scene of two monsters fighting. I made a type for all of the Pokemon types in the game, and embarrassingly had to pull up a type chart while doing this because I still don't know which types are super effective against which. Next, I had to figure out which Pokemon I was going to put in the game. I realized that putting an all of them would be too much right now, so I'd only do with some of them. I decided to add the three starters, as well as all the Pokemon that were used in the battles with the eight gym leaders. I created a scriptable object for all of them, and left out the model for the Pokemon for now. I was going to come back to that in a bit. The last thing I did was create some moves for the Pokemon to use. Just like how there are a lot of Pokemon, there are also a lot of moves. What I ended up doing was making one move for each type, and then giving that move to the Pokemon if they are of that type. So since Bulbasaur is a grass slash poison Pokemon, he will get a grass type move and a poison type move. Charmander will get a fire type move, Squirtle will get a water type move, and so on. Then I also gave every Pokemon tackle attack as a neutral normal type move. And at this point, it was time to go back and create the 3D models. And I should also mention that I severely overestimated my ability to create these voxel models. If you've seen some of my previous videos, you might think that I'm really good at creating these models, but the truth is, I'm fairly amateur at best. And because of that, I absolutely butchered Bulbasaur to the point where he's not even recognizable anymore. I'm sorry, Bulbasaur. Everything started off fine. I remade the character in 2D first to start with a base, and from there, everything just fell apart. Bulbasaur's model is viewed from an angle and not straight on, so it's kind of hard for me to interpret that in 3D. I didn't really know what to do at this point. I had about 30 Pokemon to create, and I couldn't even create one. I needed to find a new method, and then I remembered someone telling me about the follow Pokemon in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. In those games, you could get the Pokemon to follow behind you in the overworld, so I tried using these sprites to create a 3D model. And forget about the models I made in the past that look good from every angle except for the front, this Bulbasaur just straight up looks bad no matter which angle you view it from. Panicking now, I tried to use the Bulbasaur as a reference image and make it myself, and that was a mistake. The only other thing I could think of at this point would be finding a 3D Bulbasaur model online and then converting it into a voxel model using Blender. The problem with this is that it comes out with all the textures and the colors gone, which means that I would have to color it myself. And the first attempt was... interesting. And by the second attempt, I didn't even know what I was doing anymore. Just to make sure I wasn't crazy, I tried it with Charmander. Twice. 
By now, I didn't really know what to do. My only option was to use 2D sprites and try to make them similar to Paper Mario. I made it so that the Pokemon always faces toward the camera, and then I wanted to make it so that they are always oriented towards the center of the screen. So if they're on the left side of the screen, they'll be facing right, and vice versa. And instead of just making them flip around, I made them do a fancy spin. I also considered using the sprites where they're facing from the back, but I thought it would look weird with half a body just floating in the air. Even though this uses 2D sprites, I still wanted to sell the idea that it was a 3D game. So I tried to make a dynamic moving camera, like in the 3D games like Coliseum. I made a Cinemachine track circle around the Pokemon and made it so that it always faces towards the center. And now the Pokemon will flip automatically as the camera circles around them. I also made a few other camera angles to switch between, like the static cam behind your Pokemon, and a close-up of the Pokemon on each side. The only thing left to do was create the dialogue box, the health bar, and selecting the moves. There's also some behind the scenes stuff like how damage is calculated, how catch rates work, and all that other stuff, but I'm not gonna bore you with that. For now, I'll just show you what it looks like when the Pokemon are battling. I was able to make an animation for the Pokemon attacking, and the Pokemon that gets hit will start blinking and lose HP. They will also be affected by status effects the same way it would in the base game. So Poison and Burn will inflict damage at the end of the turn, Confusion has a chance to hurt the confused Pokemon, and Paralysis has a chance to stop the Pokemon from attacking. Using a potion will heal the user's Pokemon, and using a Pokeball has a chance to catch the Pokemon using this crazy mess of a method. With the battle system finished, it was time to head back to the overworld. What I needed to do now was be able to trigger battles, and be able to get items from the Pokemart, as well as heal the Pokemon at the Poke Center. So using the dialogue box I made earlier, I made it ask the player if they want to heal when they walk up to the Pokemon Center, and it will heal their Pokemon. Walking up to the Pokemart will allow the player to buy items, although the only items that I have added are the potions and the Pokeballs. Buying an item takes away money, and gives you one of that item that you purchased. And finally walking up to a gym will initiate a conversation with that respective gym leader. Since I didn't make the inside of the gym, you won't actually see the gym leader, so I took some inspiration from games like Persona 5. In those games, you can see the person talking next to the dialogue box, as well as their name. So that's exactly what I did for all 8 gym leaders. I looked up some quotes of what they would say in the game, and made that dialogue start playing when you go to their gym. And finally, I just needed a way to initiate the battle. I added triggers to the grass so that there's a small chance of triggering a battle, and also made it that the battle triggers when the gym leader dialogue ends. But just transitioning to a battle is boring, so I recreated one of the battle transitions transitions using a series of four loops to turn on black boxes scattered on the screen. Those computer science classes back from high school where I used loops to print out patterns finally paid off for once. Now obviously I can't release this game, and I'm not even sure if it's possible to beat in the first place, but maybe we can try to get a streamer to play it like Smallland or Point Crow. It's pretty similar to the mods that they've played before, so it might be okay. And let me know if you guys want a part 2 with the rest of the game. Alright, see ya.